after word. There are many other issues that I could write about, including but not limited to monetary policy in the Federal Reserve, secession, states' rights, intellectual property, energy, and health care. If you had a friend drive from New York to Los Angeles, you wouldn't want to hear about every billboard they passed, every bug they hit, and every meal they ate along the way. You'd want to hear about the time they met someone famous at a corner diner in Indiana. You'd want to hear about the unexpected detour they took to see Pikes Peak and the Four Corners Monument. Similarly, this book is intended to serve as a guide to the highlights of my path to the ideas of liberty. Speaking of detours, however, there are a few things that I wanted to include in the book that fit in neither the introduction nor in any of the chapters. Activism Let me begin by saying that I've been a self-described news junkie since my teen years. Even before I was old enough to vote, I would make calls to my member of Congress to express a view. However, I would not say that doing so makes one an activist per se. In my early 20s, I began writing letters to the editor of local newspapers and began emailing articles to friends. This was before blogging was a thing. I even ran for office several times as a means to raise awareness about various issues. However, I did not consider myself to be an activist until 2007, and I still clearly remember the moment I became an activist. In March 2007, the Alabama legislature voted itself a 62% pay raise, which the governor vetoed. However, the leadership in the Alabama legislature decided that they would vote to override that veto. Obviously, this garnered the attention of the media. Not only had the legislature voted themselves a pay raise, the manner in which they did it was very sneaky. On the morning in which the bill was approved by the Senate, the lieutenant governor was reading a list of monotonous bills in a monotone voice. After the vote was taken, one senator asked another if they had just voted themselves a pay raise and immediately called for a roll call vote. Even though several Republican senators raised their hands requesting a recorded vote, Lieutenant Governor Jim Folsom Jr. said he neither saw nor heard anyone ask for a roll call vote. If that's not enough, the pay raise was not on the agenda of the House or the Senate on the morning of the vote. Two weeks later, the vote to override the veto was on the agenda. Local media organized a protest in front of the Alabama State House for the morning of March 20th, 2007. I made the 90-mile drive from Birmingham to Montgomery to join others in a public display of opposition to this pay raise and to personally deliver the message to my senator and representative that what they were doing was a blatant abuse of power. After the rally that upwards of 200 people attended, I went into the state house to speak with the people who were supposed to be representing me. My representative was not in his office, so I wasn't able to deliver my message to him, though I caught my senator as she was leaving her office. Walking down the hallway, I told her that the state constitution had provisions on legislative pay, and if she wanted more than what was authorized by the constitution, to pass an amendment. She replied, if we amend the constitution, then the voters have to approve it, and you won't give me a pay. Pay raise. I responded, not a 62% pay raise. If you're going to give yourself a pay raise, do it the right way. By this time, about five other senators appeared near the elevator and I was asked why I was harassing the senator. Can you believe that? Speaking to your supposed representative was considered harassment by these other senators? The senators got on the elevator as I explained that I wasn't harassing anyone, rather telling my senator to vote against overriding the veto. By that afternoon, both houses of the Alabama legislature had voted to override the veto. Since that fateful Tuesday, I have volunteered to serve as a precinct coordinator for the Ron Paul 2008 presidential campaign. I was the county coordinator for a brief period for the We the People Foundation. I founded and co-chaired the Alabama affiliate of the Boston Tea Party, served on the National Committee of the Boston Tea Party as an at-large member from 2008 to 2010, and as chair from 2010 to 2012. And in 2012, I helped co-found the New Hampshire Liberty Party. I've organized tax day protests, anti-war rallies, and rallies in support of whistleblowers. After moving to New Hampshire in 2012 as part of the Free State Project, I began attending legislative committee hearings and testifying on legislation. This is probably one of the easiest things to do and in many ways more rewarding than holding a one-man tax protest. Last year, I had the idea to adopt a legislative committee and serve as a shadow legislator. During the first year of the legislative term, I attended almost every hearing held by the Election Law Committee of the New Hampshire Legislature, testified on the vast majority of the bills they heard and had a better attendance record than half of the members of the committee. Because of this citizen lobbying, I've had state reps approach me in the hallway of the legislative office building to ask me questions about bills in other committees. I've also seen state reps in random places and begun conversations
conversations about possible legislation. These conversations would not have been possible had I not gone to the state house on a regular basis. Aside from testifying to legislators, there are other ways to challenge laws and statutes. One such way is civil disobedience. I do not recommend anyone supporting a family commit acts of civil disobedience because chances are you will either pay a fine, which could have otherwise been used to feed, clothe, and house your family, or you will go to jail. I also don't recommend committing civil disobedience if you are not prepared and willing to get arrested. It's not often that an act of civil disobedience leads to a situation where a court decides to overturn the law or a legislative body decides to repeal the law, though it has happened. Forced segregation is just one example of laws that were repealed because of civil disobedience. While the term was popularized by Henry David Thoreau, the concept is much older, dating back to at least Socrates, who vowed in the apology that he will disobey the lawful jury if it orders him to stop philosophizing. Thoreau's conception of civil disobedience obedience has two principles. The first is that authority of the government depends on the consent of the governed. The second is that justice is superior to the laws enacted by the government and the individual has the right to judge whether a given law reflects or flouts justice. In the latter case, the individual has a duty to disobey the law and accept the consequences of the disobedience non-violently. Another hero of civil disobedience, Gandhi, called his practice Satyagraha, a Gujarati word meaning firmness in adhering to truth. Satyagraha, free of the defects of passive resistance, introduced six elements into the theory and the practice of civil disobedience. For Gandhi, it was not enough to seek to improve the state, it was equally necessary to seek to improve civil society. So the next time you have a chance to, please practice Satyagraha. Remember that it is your right, nay, your duty to stand up for your rights, your freedom, and your liberty. I say this as someone who has refused to comply with arbitrary laws. I have gone to court several times for nonviolent offenses that had no victim. In 2010, I took a ticket for a seatbelt violation to a jury trial. I attempted to persuade the jury to nullify the law because of Supreme Court precedent, but was threatened with contempt of court no less than five times. I was able to get the officer to tell the jury that I had told him I practiced civil disobedience, and he even admitted that he had no physical evidence that I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. Nonetheless, I was still found guilty by the jury in about five minutes. I've taken tickets for expired registration to court. I've lost both times, though I was allowed to perform community service in lieu of the fine once. The second time, in a different court, I was not allowed to perform community service and instead was sentenced to 72 hours in jail. Upon my release, I immediately said, I was not corrected. I will continue to stand up for my rights and disobey unjust laws and will encourage others to do the same. As an aside, there are some people who believe that activists should be paid for their activism and that activism will only happen if people are financially incentivized. While I'm not opposed to people donating to activists and causes they like, there should not be an expectation of financial reward for activism. I did not become an activist because I was being paid. I became an activist because I wanted to make a difference and I could afford to do activism. Activism. I would not be doing everything I am today if I were driven solely by financial motives. Publishing as stated earlier, I've considered myself a news junkie for the majority of my life, and I have an associate's degree in mass communications. While in college, I got a job working as a board operator for a pair of radio stations. One was sports talk, the other was news talk. My job was to play the commercials during the various sports broadcasts. This was before computers were able to automate that task. At the time, I was dreaming of being a sports broadcaster, though, as the sports cliche goes, life threw me a curveball. After a falling out with the program director, he wasn't happy that I went over his head after he forgot to turn in my timesheet a couple of times, I got a job as a traffic reporter. As fate would have it, one of my assignments was the pair of stations I had just left. For the next six months, I would report traffic on about half a dozen stations as Miles Marker. It was common at the time for traffic reporters to use a traffic-related pseudonym. Then in the summer of 1999, I decided to chase love and move to Pennsylvania. For the next several years, I tried off and on to get back into the radio business, but was told numerous times that I was either overqualified or underqualified for the position, and I began to think of broadcasting as just a phase in my life. 
In 2008, when I was working for a subsidiary of Delta Airlines, I took a trip to Washington, D.C. After landing, my plans changed, so I decided to visit the museum. Visiting the museum reignited something in me, though it would be nearly a year before the inspiration would be put into action. The primary inspiration was a single quote on the walls. Freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. A.J. Liebling A few months earlier, I began writing monthly commentary for the website nolanchart.com. Around the same time, I was writing a series of articles based on interviews with minor party presidential candidates. Coincidentally, I interviewed Constitution Party presidential nominee Chuck Baldwin on my phone in a stairwell of the museum. But that quote stuck with me. What, I thought to myself, would happen if the website I'm writing for shuts down? What if the newspapers stop printing my letters to the editor? What if the local talk radio shows stop taking callers. It was my quest to find an answer that led me to create my own media outlets with the purpose of ensuring a free press for the freedom movement. I wanted to ensure not just my own freedom of the press, but that of everyone else who valued liberty. I wanted to not only provide an online platform, but a physical platform as well through books and other print media. In early 2009, I was asked to provide weekly commentary for the unofficial newspaper of West Virginia University. So by the time FP was launched, I had been creating regular content for several months. And a couple of months before launching FPP, I edited and published Songs of Freedom, Tells from the Revolution as a tribute to the Ron Paul 2008 campaign. This book would later be named one of four finalists in the current event's political social category of the Best Books 2010 Awards and was selected Book of the Month for August 2009 by Freedom Book Club. The Anarcho Teachings of Yeshua, which was published in 2010, won awards from Freedom Book Club and Lava. In 2011, I found out about podcasting and began creating audio versions of my weekly commentary into short podcasts. Several months later, I was listening to Free Talk Live and heard Ian Freeman mention that he'd like to replace the Fox News 5-minute radio newscast that aired at the top of the hour on the Liberty Radio Network. I contacted him about airing the FPP Freedom Minute and was given some tips on how to improve the quality of the audio so it would sound good on the air. After moving to New Hampshire in April 2012, I was allowed to use the LRN. FM studio for recording, which meant for the first time since 1999, I had the ability to use professional recording equipment. I was also invited to be a co-host on Free Talk Live, and in October 2013, began working for Free Talk Live doing affiliate relations. By December 2012, I began hosting my own weekly two-hour radio show on LRN.FM, Peace, Love, Liberty Radio, in addition to the FPP Freedom Minute, and in February 2014, began producing a daily five-minute newscast. FPP Radio News. Over the summer of 2012, what had been a newsletter that was mailed to subscribers became a monthly newspaper that was distributed via newspaper racks across New Hampshire. I joined the cast of Free Keen TV, which later became Shire TV, which later morphed into Black Sheep Rising. My adult life, which began with me pursuing a degree in broadcasting, has, through a series of detours, led me to owning my own media duchy. Final Thoughts You have traveled with this rebel on his path to liberty. However, my journey is not over. There are still many miles ahead of me. And just as my journey did not begin on the day I was born, my journey will not end on the day that I die, whenever that may be in the future. As long as there is air to breathe, there will be someone with the rebel spirit to continue my journey. Because my journey is a rebel's journey, and a rebel's journey never ends.